This is Capital Ideas TV, on location in Vancouver. Coming up, the co-founder of Big Blockchain Intelligence Group, tracking cryptocurrency hackers. The Escape from Calgary, the CEO of Quest Air Energy, sitting on a massive natural gas play in Quebec. And Carl Data Solutions CEO, making sense of big industrial data with predictive analytics. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. Wherever there's money, there is theft. And right now there's a massive amount of money pouring into the cryptocurrency trade. And that has sent hackers flocking to the nascent industry. And so far they've been able to operate with near impunity. Have a look at some of their most successful heists. This year's attack on CoinCheck tops the list with half a billion dollars worth of NEM stolen. Just behind it is the infamous breach of the Mt. Gox exchange in 2014. Altogether, hackers have nabbed more than $1.3 billion in the biggest hacks alone. There's no telling how much investors have been taken for in total. It's not just cryptocurrency exchanges that are vulnerable. Hackers often trick individuals into handing over access to their digital wallets using phishing scams. One Ukrainian hacker group has made off with more than $50 million in cryptocurrencies using these techniques. Others install malicious software on users' computers and use them to have those computers unwittingly mine cryptocurrencies to finance criminal organizations. Information security firm Kaspersky Labs identified 1.65 million of these attempts in the first eight months of 2017. That was a record pace, and it only represents attempts that were caught. With cryptocurrency trading becoming more popular, that trend is likely to grow even more concerning in the coming years. The anonymity of the blockchain that underlies crypto trading makes it difficult to track down thieves after a hack. Big Blockchain Intelligence Group is working to give law enforcement an edge in their pursuit of crypto criminals. The company has developed a software platform called Clue that helps investigators track the illicit use of cryptocurrencies. It's also behind a tool called BitRank Verified that enhances the transparency of crypto trades. Big Blockchain's executive chairman, president and co-founder Sean Anstey discusses how these products work and how the company plans to make them mainstream staples in the security industry. Sean, I'm sure you'd agree that the cryptocurrency sector uh, needs a bit of an image makeover when it comes to trust. There was that hack of that Japanese exchange several weeks ago, more than half a billion in cryptocurrency, and your company's technology was able to track that back to the culprits, as, at least to where uh, it, it originated. So explain how you did that and what the significance of that is. Sure, that's, uh, that's a great question. So our company's mandate is to help bring cryptocurrencies mainstream. Uh, to that end, we have to clean up its image. So it is a great technology, but it, like most great technologies, it's embraced by criminals first because they are typically in high-risk businesses where they will either make a lot of money, go to jail, or get killed. And so cryptocurrency is a natural for them to take on to. It, it in itself is not bad, but the image that it has needs to be cleaned up. Uh, in regards to the hack that uh, we looked into, uh, we were able to trace the, uh, the funds using our technology and our team's knowledge and, and uh, understanding of the space. Uh, back to a choke point where law enforcement can now investigate and find the, the next trail of the money to, to where it has gone to. Now you have uh, some significant technology that you're excited about. Let's start with with, with Clue. What, what exa exactly is that and how, how does it work? Great. And why is it important for yeah, So Clue is a, a flagship product of ours. Uh, it is used by law enforcement today out of Washington, D.C. and other law enforcement agencies. And it allows us to trace, track, and, and monitor cryptocurrency. Uh, we have sophisticated algorithms within it that show us the, the, how the data is all interconnected, how the money is all interconnected. That makes it very easy for law enforcement to follow the, the trail of the money uh, in visual terms. So it demystifies some of it so you can train uh, uh, officers up very quickly without them having the need to, to understand deep programming. And what is BitRank verified and how do you plan to position that down the road? Uh, BitRank Verified is our, our real blue sky. We're very excited about BitRank Verified. Now, BitRank Verified is our uh, ability to risk score every Bitcoin address in the ecosystem. So we will take every address, we'll give it a score between 0 and 100. Uh, the higher the score, the safer the address is to transact with. We can currently handle 7 billion lookups a month. We can do the lookup in less than a second. And we deliver this programmatically through an API to any company that wants to take it on and embed it in their system. Why, why is it important? Well, financial institutions will have to engage in cryptocurrency because it is the future. Uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and anyone in the space right now needs compliance and risk mitigation at the gateway. 
So you would use BitRank Verify to check the score of an address before uh, the money enters into your system and you can freeze it and decide what you want to do with it. Uh, if the ranking is good, you can, you can determine that you want to take it. If it is bad, you can freeze the funds and, and, uh, and act accordingly. You've been touching on, on it a bit here, but governments and regulators are starting to s scrutinize heavily the cryptocurrency sector. So how do we balance privacy and transparency? And also, again, you, you talked about this a bit, uh, how do we get more trust in the con in, for consumers so they can they can trust the sector and get more involved and accept it? Absolutely. So regulators themselves have been educating, um, getting more education on how this space works. And this is a big part of understanding uh, how Bitcoin and crypto functions. Uh, regulation itself is not bad for the industry. What we're seeing is that when regulars pass regulations that make sense, uh, it gives consumers and it gives businesses businesses the framework that they need in order to uh, to function within the space. Uh, we like to say that there's no board of directors for any financial institution that will ever allow cryptocurrency in there, and thus they can be compliant with uh, anti-money laundering regulations. Let's talk money now. You've raised nearly 20 million recently. What are you planning to do with that? Yeah, so we, we are very successful in the capital markets. We've had great support from institutions. Uh, we're very grateful for that. Uh, we've been working on our, our systems and our company for a number of years now. So I think one of the, thing, the things that they saw is that, one, we have some very real products. The people in our company are, are not new to the cryptocurrency space. We've been in the space since 2011 and 2012. We've done a lot of things within the space itself. So we have a lot of knowledge that is, uh, we're able to uh, put into our products. Um, and this is one of the things that when we look at cryptocurrency companies in the space, we look at that to determine whether they um, have the technical chops to move forward, right? You're seeing a lot of people move into the space now that maybe a few months back were in a completely and totally different industry. Um, so for our capital moving forward, we have been exp uh, uh, expanding our team aggressively in terms of adding more developers because it is a race in terms of getting your development products uh, to the market faster than anyone else. Uh, we've been adding to our, our sales staff as well, and we've been adding to our forensics team uh, as well. What about uh, customers? Um, I don't suppose you, know, you can name names, but uh, do you have customers, and, and uh, is there a good pipeline there, and, and, and can you do any revenue projections? Yeah, so we've been very, very aggressive about adding to our pipeline. So over the last... Uh, uh, 60 days since the drop of the hat in the new year, we've been uh, pushing very hard. Our pipeline, we feel, is quite full. Uh, we've been working with legal to get the proper legal documents drafted up so that we're, we're, we're properly protected and, and things flow smoothly. Uh, we have started to, uh, to see some closure on some of them, and we're going to move forward aggressively with it. And lastly, what do you say to investors who are looking at the, the crypto and blockchain space? They're excited. They're they're nervous, they're skeptical. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you convince them that, that, that this is a really viable business? Yeah, that? that's, that's, a, that's a good point. So our business is very, very fundamental to crypto, the crypto world. This is search and analytics. Search and analytics will never, ever go away. You will always need to look up information. You always need to make sense of information. The transaction volume on the networks are growing at an exponential rate, which means more and more data, more and more uh, opportunity for us to make sense of information and, and it creates more value for what we do just by the sheer fact that we are open for business and adding more data to our system every day. Uh, there is tremendous value in this and this is one of the things we, we try to um, impress upon our shareholders the understanding that cryptocurrency represents not just the new payment networks, not just the new value store or what have you, it really represents the next generation of the internet itself. This is a trust and transaction protocol layer of the internet and payment is only the first use case, like email was the first use case in the 90s when the internet itself was rolled out. And when you start to see it from that perspective, you start to understand how big it can be. So from our company perspective, we are well positioned for that growth of the next generation of the internet, and making sense of all that data. Right now you walk inside a truck and you see multiple devices. You see a fleet management device, you see a two-way radio, black box, tablet of some sort, front camera, six to $10,000 worth of equipment, we're shrinking down to less than $1,000 in one device. The change in the cabin is just dramatic. It's just much, much safer for the truck driver to be able to use one device. Really what we're doing is we're creating a new environment and a new technology that has not been seen to date in, in the market. Prices for oil and gas appear to be on the mend, but it's anyone's guess as to how much the market will actually recover. For producers operating under uncertain conditions like these, being lean on costs and flexible on financials is a necessity. A little diversification geographically doesn't hurt either. 
Questair Energy believes it has a portfolio that checks all of the boxes investors are looking for. The company holds a number of oil and gas properties across North America and abroad. There's a tight oil project in southeast Saskatchewan, a liquids-rich and low-cost natural gas play in western Alberta, and shale oil deposits in eastern Saskatchewan, Utah, and the Kingdom of Jordan in the Middle East. But the crown jewel is the massive shale gas play in the lowlands of Quebec. It's part of the gigantic Utica Shale Formation. The Canadian Energy Research Institute estimates the region could boast the second lowest cost for gas in North America. That gas could fetch a high price, too. Natural gas is twice as expensive in Quebec as it is in Western Canada. Put it all together and you have the components for a junior oil and gas producer ready for prime time. Analysts at Swedbank are among those with an optimistic outlook for Quest Air once the gas starts to flow in Quebec. They see the company approaching 30,000 barrels of energy per day as soon as the first quarter of 2023. First production of commercial gas out of Quebec is expected in late 2020 or early 2021. Swedbank also believes the resource estimate for Questair's Quebec project is on the conservative side. That leaves room for a positive surprise in the longer term. The government of Quebec recently cleared the way for hydrocarbon development in the province, and that takes some of the risk out of Questair's operations. Now the company is continuing its drilling in the lowlands, with fresh updates to come throughout the year. Questair CEO Michael Binion discusses the ongoing work in the province and the economics that make the place so favorable. Michael, let's start with your Quebec lowlands project. Uh, tell us about the economics of it and the potential of it. Right. You know, we started Questair with with the idea that we could find, uh, or with the idea that it was possible to find giant gas fields in North America. And then we started it in the year 2000 as a private company, went public in around 2004, 2005. And you know, our idea was to find a giant field in North America, and and, and I'd come out of the international area, so this was sort of coming back to uh, Canada. Um, the, you know, our idea was you had to look at a new kind of rock that the, all the big giant fields had all been discovered decades before. So if we're going to find it, we have to look at new kinds of rock, and we we ended up with a number of different projects, but one of them was in Quebec, a big exploration project. A uh, number of different ideas there. One of them being naturally naturally fract naturally fractured shales. Um, uh, that that of course, uh, as time and technology moved on, turned out to be just shale that that we that we artificially fracture, and uh, that that discovery, uh, you know, has turned out to be one of the giant fields. So the company goal of finding a giant field, you know, we we could put a check mark beside that, and I'll just give you a couple quick things what we like about it w one is size uh, it's you know we it's a it's a it's a small basin but we've tied up basically the whole basin so we we've got a what we think is a Fayetteville type uh, you know Barnett type of size of discovery so 25 TCF so big um, we like that it's on tidewater and it's close to market so we have the opportunity not only not only do we have a premium market that uh, play you know the local price is Henry Hub plus one dollar. Um, it 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 also has the potential to export gas, whether it's as plastic as fertilizer as LNG. But we have the opportunity to create a bigger market than where we are because we're on tidewater, which which of course is a problem for some other places as we know. And then the final thing is our results. We you know thirty wells drilled for for shale gas, um, most of them tested, and we have results that are comparable and analogous to the Ohio Utica, um, Ohio, Ohio Utica probably moving through four BCF a day and was discovered a few years after Quebec. So there, there's the, the pitch for Quebec, premium market, um, premium market, large, great test results, economic, um, and even in a low gas price environment that we have, you know, very economic project. Let's move along to the CACWA project in Alberta, where you say the economics of this are exceptional. Why do you say that? Well, the, the one reason is that it's primarily a light oil or condensate uh, project. So the, our economics are driven, the economics are driven by the condensate, which is a West Texas, uh, you know, Edmonton Par Plus or West Texas type of market for pricing. And so we've, we're avoiding, uh, you know, the current you know, ongoing problems in Western Canada around uh, gas and heavy, 
you know, bitumen and heavy oil, which are all trading at substantial discounts to the North American market. We're, our, you know, our main product is is trading at world prices, and we are participating fully in the recovery of the oil price that's happened in the last 12 months. So that, I would say that's one core reason we're in light oil. Um, the the other reason is that uh, you know our you know we were one of the very first companies, if not the first, but certainly one of the first companies to be even look get into this shale game in Canada. And I think we very you know we're one of the first to realize it's all about the sweet spots. And you know we took out 60, 70, 80 sections in the Montney. And we very quickly, first of all, knew to look for sweet spots. It wasn't just about getting land. We knew very early you had to look for sweet spots. But B, in this CACWA area, we're immediately offsetting XDO and seven generations. We found one. And, and we've really dropped the, some of the rest of our land, even though it has impressive resource numbers on paper. We can talk about you know, billions of cubic feet of gas, many billions of cubic feet of gas, we dropped the acreage anyways because we knew it wasn't the sweet spot. CACWA is a sweet spot, 200 barrels a million, um, light oil economics, and uh, we've had great results, over 20 over 20 wells drilled just on our own acreage, lots and lots of wells drilled by XTO, Paramount, uh, uh, seven generations immediately offsetting our acreage. So we are highly confident of what our type curve looks like, and we're, you know, we're, we're drilling while we went penalty on a few wells when the prices were down at $30, we are uh, per certainly participating in every well now. Now, Questair has a very interesting, diverse geographic footprint. Can you give investors a sense of uh, production targets and revenue and earnings targets this year, 2018? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just go, I guess, maybe with our our production and, and cash flow. We're, we're, um, we're, 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 we're we're moving through 2,000 barrels a day, um, as I said, mostly light oil in 2018. And 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 we're expecting that uh, by the end of 2018, we're going to have cash flow that'll cover not just our, you know, not just positive cash flow, but but true free cash flow where our cash flow is covering our capex requirements. So we're we're expecting uh, 15 million dollars plus in in net cash flow from just our our Alberta and Saskatchewan projects this year. And then, of course, I think it's important to emphasize when we get onto this subject that the company really is about our mega projects. And we have a mega project in, in Quebec. We have a, another mega project in Jordan. Um, but, but we've got a nice little oil and gas company uh, that's, that sits underneath those mega projects. Speaking of that mega project in Jordan, let's move there. I, you have a memorandum of understanding with the government. I understand that ex expires in May of this year. So will that get extended? We have given notice. Uh, what, what's required is is that uh, you know we either need to extend that, which we're we're highly optimistic we could extend that memorandum of understanding, and that that's based not just on our own discussions with the government there. It's based on what we've seen happen in the in the country. Uh, you know, all of the other people who've got similar permits and our memorandums of understanding have all been successful getting extensions. However, uh, we're we're actually moving. Uh, to the next phase, we we've done our resource assessment. That's out in the public markets, and that was, in our view, very successful. Uh, you know, 20 billion barrels of total resource. We think 8 billion barrels of it, you know, certified and uh, close enough to surface. This is a surface mining, like, like a little bit analogous to oil sands. It's a surface mining project for oil shales, and so we're moving to the next phase. We want to move from um, from from the uh, resource identification phase, which we think we've done and is successful, we now want to move into the phase where we actually negotiate a mining, uh, a mining concession. Lastly, Michael, uh, in a sector where investors may be a bit gun shy and defensive and maybe get into some of the, the bigger names like a Suncor and a CNQ, make the investment case that, that Quest Air is where uh, investors want to put a bit of their money. Sure. Well, I, I think the main, the main case, as I've talked about, is I, I think we have two amazing uh, mega projects that can take Questair from being a you know, small uh, you know, regional oil and gas company like, you know, like many other and, and, and many other companies are, that are successful here in Alberta. Um, but we really have that chance to move to a whole new level uh, with success of either of our mega projects. And, and I think we've had good success in the last two years that, that make both of them promising. So I think it's the, it's the, 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 the big upside 
uh, of moving up to a whole new type of company or level of company. Um, the other thing I would say is our mega projects are diversified away from the, the challenges that we've got with natural gas and, and heavy oil differentials here in Alberta. So we're diversified away from that. And then finally, I would say that we've, we've got a very successful junior oil and gas company in the you know Motney and and in the Bakken that underpins our company so that we're we're not we're not using you know we're not using shareholder capital to fund overheads on our on our on our uh, mega projects. Uh, so we finance top tier companies in the medical cannabis industry in exchange for a royalty. I, I love the royalty model. I think it works perfectly for uh, this industry at this time. Debt is largely not available in the U.S. Um, and equity uh, can be massively dilutive. And the reality is every company in California and most states right now is a startup company. Uh, so we offer a very attractive, either a complement uh, or an attractive alternative to debt or equity, uh, which really aligns our financial interests with the interests of the people that we invest in. So when they're successful, we're successful. And the more successful they are, the more successful we are. Pearl Data Solutions operates in the big data as a service and industrial internet of things sectors where it uses predictive analytics. It has water infrastructure contracts with the likes of the cities of Dallas, Los Angeles, and Toronto, and a few others. We have the CEO now, Greg Johnston, who updates us on what's happening with the company. Greg, let's focus on the core business of Carl Data Solutions, big data as a service. And a lot of that involves uh, predictive analytics. So give us an update on that. What's, uh, what's happening in that area? We've got uh, several new features that we've, we've put out, and uh, we're really excited to, to be uh, uh, including uh, the, the predictive analytics and machine learning features right into uh, our application, built right into it. Now that we've uh, moved uh, the infrastructure for most of our SaaS-based applications, over to uh, this uh, NoSQL platform, we can build right in these, these predictive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, whatever you want to call them, features uh, right into the applications. There's, uh, um, there's use for these things. Uh, right now, we're, we're building uh, out uh, uh, dashboards and uh, monitoring for tech resources uh, for tailing spawns. Uh, we're also going to be uh, in putting putting them in uh, and using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, look up uh, uh, combined sewage overflow events and predict uh, uh, certain events that happen in uh, sewers and stormwater systems for for cities. Those will be coming up uh, pretty soon. It's uh, it's a very exciting time for us. So you touched on it there: wastewater infrastructure management, a big part of what you do. And we've talked before about the deals that you have, the contracts that you have with. Dallas and Toronto and LA is another one, I guess, right? That's right. So what's the latest uh, there and uh, do you have more deals in the pipeline? Are you talking to more cities? We, we, we do have uh, uh, qu quite a few more uh, cities. Uh, we're, we're doing uh, something uh, uh, for, for Boston, which is very interesting. It's uh, CSO reporting uh, for, uh, to, to warn uh, their public uh, when, when one of these events occurs and so uh, people don't uh, inadvertently go into the water uh, when there's there's sewage in the water when there's a potential danger to to the uh, the public. Uh, we're very excited about that because uh, uh, for the Great Lakes uh, um, cities, all the cities surrounding the Great Lakes, they've decided that uh, this is something that they should be sharing with uh, with with people and reporting on a regular basis. Uh, we have a ready built application for for these cities to to actually use, and so uh, I think. Uh, we'll be able to, to get into that market and work with these cities much closer uh, moving forward. You made an acquisition of some assets recently in the hardware area. How do these assets fit into to what you already do? Well, we, we, uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the more data we get, the, the better we are at, at, uh, at coming up with uh, great insights into uh, infrastructure management uh, or agriculture, forestry, uh, mining, dams, utilities. Uh, the uh, what we want to do is, is uh, fill the gap and, and create uh, create hardware solutions, data loggers, things that uh, uh, that are required in the marketplace, but uh, they don't exist because th there's a gap. It, they don't have the right uh, a particular piece of equipment to uh, put into a certain area. So an example of that is we have a, a pilot project out right now with uh, a local company called uh, Peak Disposal and. Uh, but what we're doing is, is we're, we're uh, building hardware all around the rims of uh, their, uh, uh, their solid waste bins 
and uh, we'll, we'll be telling them or, or uh, uh, telling them as soon as these bins are, are close to being full. So they can automatically just pick them up. The, the customer doesn't have to call. The whole solution is, is completely automated. Uh, and they'll be able to turn over these bins uh, when they're 95% uh, or 100% versus 125% and pay, pay an extra fee. So th there's lots of uh, uses for that. Uh, but uh, this is the, the test case for, for the new hardware. And we're really excited about that too. Seems to make too much sense, what, what you just described there. So uh, the company recently raised nearly $3 million. What are you going to do with that, uh, with that money? So, so a lot of that money goes to, uh, to research and development. We, we're, we're still uh, focused heavily on uh, building our artificial intelligence, uh, the machine learning aspects of our, our platform. This is really, really important because, of course, uh, we feel that uh, there's a data revolution happening, obviously, and the... Uh, uh, all the information that we're going to be getting is going to be coming in in bigger and bigger volumes, and we want to be prepared for that. We want to be able to offer the, uh, uh, the, the, the features in our, our SaaS-based solutions or our web service solutions uh, to, to be able to handle and accommodate that data. Uh, so a lot, uh, a lot of money is, is earmarked for research and development. Uh, also, there's money uh, earmarked for uh, uh, sales and marketing, of course, because uh, we want people to know that, uh, that we have these products uh, available and uh, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we, we can distribute them. And that's part of the reason you're here today as well. So let's talk about the stock, which has underperformed a bit. Um, you're, it sounds like you have a lot going on at the company. The markets don't seem to be hearing the story. Why do you think that is and, and, and how do you get them to, to get it? I, I, I don't think that, uh, that uh, well, I, I, think, I, well, I think it'll come back. Uh, I, I think it's just a matter of uh, me getting out and, and, and making sure that people hear the story. And there's lots of people like me actually telling the story. Uh, a lot of people have called the big data uh, revolution, coupled with I, IIoT and IoT, uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, you can't say something bigger than that. And, and the, the, uh, uh, what, what's happening, though, is it's not instant. It's, it's happening over time. And uh, we're ahead of the curve. We're at the forefront of, this, uh, of, of what's actually happening. And I think uh, you're going to see uh, the market, uh, I mean, once, once they've, they've gotten over some of the, uh, uh, the, the flashy things uh, and, uh, right now, and, and hopefully we get over this, uh, this little correction that we're happening, you're going to see a lot of that, uh, that money uh, refocus back into, I think, what uh, people see as the core technology issue that's, uh, th that's going to be coming and facing us uh, in the future, which is uh, this, the big data aspect of that, which we're, we're, we're solidly grounded in. That is our, that is our core business. <laughs>of the data that's, uh, that's ever been created has been created in the past two years. You need uh, a system for analyzing and, and making sense out of that data, and that's what we do. Where, where we, I think, really shine is, is we're, we're a turnkey solution. We have uh, hardware uh, products that we can put in place. We have telemetry that we can put in place. It's uh, all cloud-based, and uh, we do it all for you. From the heart of the Financial District in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great research and great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.